Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this uh, wonderful video uh, where we have the pleasure of speaking today with Franz Vermeulen. Hello Franz. Hello Marco, good morning, maybe your afternoon. Yes, my afternoon, your morning. Uh, so I'll just quickly introduce myself for those who don't know me, as uh, Franz is far more famous than I am. <laughs> so I'm Marcus Piezia, CEO of Zusoft, the company that looks after Radar Opus uh, homeopathic software program. Um, we've had the pleasure of having Franz today with us because we're really excited about a new product that has just come out or is coming out um, called Source and Substance. And we're pretty excited about that, aren't we, France? Yes, so am I. It, it took many years to compose, and I'm very happy that you will have it out soon. Yes, we're very much looking forward to it. It's uh, It's been an unbelievable amount of work, especially for you, but for us too. Uh, and so let's get straight into it. Um, why did you make the Supplement Your Medica? What is it about? Well, the name is called Source and Substance. So the idea is to connect to the source for three reasons. The first one is that we need to know where our mat materia medica comes from. Mm. It is connected to something outside of the materia medica. It's an independently existing substance somewhere, a plant, an animal, a fungus, a mineral, it's out there. In contrast to school medicine, that uh, engineers in the laboratory certain substances which have no existence outside of a laboratory. Indeed. That's Indeed. the thing to mark. And the second reason is we need to know what is what, and we need to know where it stands, what, what is its grouping, what is it a member of. For the reason that source-based prescribing currently is a, a trend, it's a development in homeopathy where material outside of the existing material medica is used for prescribing. Secondly, family-based prescribing where the grouping is used as the first factor of consideration in which grouping lies the remedy that you want to prescribe. So therefore you need to know the grouping where it is part of to describe in a reasonable, sensible way. Makes perfect sense. So uh, I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of perhaps some of our listeners. So, okay, we may have different types of homeopaths, you know, less experience, more experience, classical, modern. Uh, what type of homeopath do you think would need or could really use something like source and substance? I think all of them, because um, it is so far not fully understood that where homeopathy gets its materia medica from, it's generally believed that it is just the effects of the substance. Mm. In a sense, that is right, but at the same time, it is enlightening to notice that there are elements of a substance that won't come through in improving, but still will have a possibility for prescribing. For instance, Homeopathy is based on a likeness. It resembles. So that can be extended. It's not just not the effects of cause and effect. It is also morphology, looking alike. It is phytochemistry, affecting alike. It is genetic or DNA, being alike. It is ecology, living alike. It is utility, using alike. It is folklore, alike. It's behavioral acting about all these elements should be included at least at the side of a materia medica, and that's the intention of it. And it will, I think, greatly help people in differentiating one from the other and and viewing the materia medica in a more clear light. So, really, if I can summarize uh, for humble non homeopath like me. Uh, we, we're not just talking about quantity, we're talking about quality and we're talking about the way that a homeopath really can enlarge the scope of his or her work to be a good homeopath essentially. Correctly. In source-based prescribing is based on the fact that an individual might mention certain things in his style of living, maybe in the way how he speaks, in his phrasing of matters, maybe in the way how he expresses his symptoms. There is something that is not in the materia medica. 
Indeed. or it's not necessarily an effect, but it is a part of. So we should learn to distinguish that and we should learn to include those things. And source-based prescribing is an excellent development in doing that. But for that, it is essential that we have the source right. Absolutely, absolutely. And identity of the source needs to be without any discussion. And ob if obviously, we, uh, sorry to interrupt you, the, the advantage obviously of having such work in a program like Red Ripples is the speed of search because you have all this you know, qualitative data that you're bringing out and then the ability of a user to then take this source and actually quite quickly to utilize the search methods in order to apply the Materia Medica onto the repertorization work. Right, the Opus has the, uh, the possibility to search words or to search two words and that is greatly helpful because this contains material that's not in the Materia Medica to a large extent considering that this 8,000 book pages, there is no publisher willing to publish an 8,000 book page on Materia Medica. So Radar offers, offers the possibility to extend largely your search possibilities. For instance, take the word twisting. Let's suppose you're going to look for twisting because a person says, well, I have a twisting pain in my belly. And then repertory-wise, it would say colosynthesis. Okay, but you want to look for the word and you find um, the, the word twisting under orchids because orchids in their behavioral have the word twisting. They twist their flowers or they twist their um, branches, etc., in a particular way that no other plant does. Hmm. So what, wouldn't we include the word twisting as a general indication for orchids? Why not? Makes sense. That's of it, and Rader Opus offers that possibility to look through that whole mass of information to look for a particular word specifically, yeah. instead of a symptom only. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And uh, ju just to quote you earlier, uh, I, I think you're, you're you're right. No publisher uh, would probably you know print eight thousand pages. Only someone who is as mad as we are <laughs> would include it into the, the, the program, but. I think what, what's key for us, Franz, is that uh, Ray Dropers, but you know, in general, uh, you know, software companies in the homeopathic world are really about trying to give homeopath as much information as possible that is uh, yeah. available in the easiest and fastest manner. Uh, right. But this shouldn't really uh, affect the quality of the homeopath's work. Uh, and I think source and substance and your work in general is important for, for that reason. W you know, working faster doesn't necessarily have to mean working with less quality. No, no. I think a, a part of understanding the Materia Medica is taking every now and then the time, maybe you set an hour a day apart, just look through it. Just have a look at things and just have a look at remedy names and click on it and see what you get. To what does it relate? Where is it? What are the effects? How does it live? How does it act? Etc. Just to teach yourself instead of always symptom searching or remedy searching like we do. We need to be informed about what we prescribe. We need to know what we prescribe. Which, which, uh, I sorry to interrupt you. I guess that that could be described as a difference between someone just using a repertory and trying, you know, to right. find a quick solution or someone right. who is actually interested in gaining knowledge to become a better homeopath. Absolutely true. And absolutely, there are, there are places for both. But I do believe that your success is going to increase when you increase your knowledge. When you have a, a specific basis of prescribing only based on a symptom that you can find in the repertory, it's very limited. Yeah. There is yeah. More out there doable in homeopathy than just that. Yeah. And it, it's mainly, mainly based on the belief that the homeopathic material medica is the result of something solid like proving. Yeah. Not so. The material medica is an eclectic mixture of all kinds of data coming from all kinds of angles mixed together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's per Particularly true of the 19th century Materia Medica, which is very largely eclectic. 
a classic herbal doctors from the 19th century in America. Then you have allopathic influences, you have empirical influences, you have aromatherapy, you have flower essences, mm. you have bug flowers, you have clinical observations. That's all mixed in. And source of substance distinguishes those. It says this information comes from that source. Fantastic, fantastic. So, uh, I mean, you, you've mentioned remedies uh, and you've mentioned, you know, we've mentioned repertory and obviously, okay, you know, we have synthesis, but uh, we, we know that, you know, whilst the repertory is essential, it has to be accompanied really by Materia Medica. It, it's almost like uh, a love affair. You, you know, you, you, need, you need both, really, you, you know, uh, to, to be successful. And so, uh, what remedies are included um, in Source and Substance? There are 4,275 remedies composed uh, or compiled from uh, the list of the various repertory makers or the Materia Medica providers, digital, and I've uh, taken them all. I started with A and I ended with Z. And I combined both of those of greater opus and reference work and I put them together in a list of 4,275. That's available in the Materia Medica and or available from pharmaceutical companies, homeopathic ah, pharmaceutical who make those. Fantastic. So That's big. That's a, a very big list and a very long list. A few sleepless nights, I would say. <laughs> well, there were only a few that I couldn't find, but in general I found them all back. But that's what it is, and sometimes the names are confusing, there are misspellings, uh, uh, wrong species, etc., etc. But that was fun, fun of the work. Excellent. And, uh, okay, so, I mean, we know more or less, you know, we've had a good introduction, but, uh, you know, what, go, going a bit deeper into source and substance, what is the work, you know, what, what about the categories which I noticed when, when I was able to preview the work? Right. Well... In addition to the three ones that we generally use, the plant kingdom, the mineral kingdom, and the animal kingdom, I've added eight. Oh. And these categories are 11, and they consist of the following. I will look my, at my notes for, sure. for a moment, what they are. So, apart from the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the minerals, we have fungi as a special group. We have the nozos as a special group. We have the sarcos as a special group. They are often co uh, confused. <coughs> we have vulnerables, the things you can't see, like light and fire. And, well, fire, of course, you can see. But biochemicals, we have the chemicals, we have organic compounds, and we have pharmaceuticals. And pharmaceuticals is a thing that all practitioners come across with. Because mm. They are prescribed by school medicine, drug class, trade names, description, adverse effects, contradictions, Contraindications, I've all included that, so you can follow through uh, radar office what the, the drug that the person might be on that comes into your office has a side effect, so you won't confuse them. Very handy. Side. Very, very handy. Also, because I imagine that that happens quite often. You, you may oh. have, you know, patients who come, oh. they're they are using, you know, some kind of drug, you know, and you got to sit there and think, okay, how is that going to affect um, my, my work, yeah. essentially? And you have the drug interactions, which is generally known to uh, happen a lot in school medicine, and I've put that on a separate section as well. And some of these have earned a place in homeopathy, but most of them, the information comes from school medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. The, the categories, by the way, I've subdivided that ah. because it, a, a plant is a plant, you could say, but also you could say there's a, there are ferns, there are mosses, there are trees, ah, there, okay, are, so. there are lianas, fungi are all, you have yeast, you have lichens, you have molds, you have uh, uh, polypores, you have parasitic fungi, and so on, and so on. So I subdivided that to help in the differential diagnosis. Which is the typical uh, type of precision that I think one can expect from your books for those who have already got your fungi monera and so on. Um, okay, now on to two peculiar questions because um, I, when, when I received the uh, extract, there were two things that, um, you know, were highlighted in my mind and, and things that, you know, I've, I've never seen in a Medica before. One was a peculiar name of uh, Cues and Clues. What's that all about? 
Cues and clues are meant as a help in prescribing to distinguish the characteristics of a plant or an animal or a substance used outside of its effects. Meaning? For, in for instance, we take barriaga. Barriaga is a freshwater sponge. It's a Russian name and uh, essentially comprises four different freshwater species. So I investigate those species, and in, under cues and clues, I write Cecil, so attached, mm -hmm. growing into one, or fusion, and I put those as cues and clues because that, that might be elements of the person's life, growing into ah. use uh, in what might be a way how they describe the relationship, or fusion with some sort of great interest, they may use that word. So I believe that the use of those words specific for a person should also be possible to find back specific to a substance. I believe in a likeness on that level, specifically. That should be close to source-based prescribing. That's the idea of it. So cues and clues contains clues to prescribe on the basis of the characteristics of the substance. What is what is typical for this substance in the way how it behaves and lives its life. Franz, this sounds like, uh, like a, a really good idea, but I must say, I don't think I've ever seen that in Amateur America be before. Is, is, that, is that right? Yeah. Well, in uh, uh, one of my synoptics, I have a, a small section, cues and clues, but only for the remedies there. Uh, and here in Source and Substance, I've tried it for all of them. I, I guess Some, that's one of those, you know, one of those genius ideas that when you look at it, you kind of think, why has nobody thought about it before? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Cool. France did. No, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. I, I guess it's, you know, it's uh, just looking deeper into things to ensure that the information you are looking at actually has a source, makes sense, it's connected. Uh, it, but then it makes sense in the sense that we need to realize Materia Medica is not just about medical things, it's about people, it's about living organisms, they live their life, they do it in a particular way, as humans do. Mm. So why don't we look at the likeness there as well? For me, it makes perfect sense. Well, I think alike is a pretty important word in homeopathy anyway, so you know, all makes sense. Alike. We like alike. Indeed, we do. Um, okay, so the the second one that, that I had in the, uh, in, you know, in the, um, uh, I guess, in the introduction that you sent us was close relations section. What's that all about? It is about the word close. Close means intimately related. What we have currently is in Clark and Burdeke are either relationships or relations, as in Burdeke or relation. That relates to remedies supposedly connected to each other through particular symptoms, sometimes one, sometimes two. For instance, it would say on an exomica, for instance, it's an example, I don't know whether it's really so, but it would say uh, antidote, lily integrinum, brackets, headache. That has been an observation made once by a person, maybe during a proving, maybe during a, something else. For me, that is random. That's sure. super. We cannot rely on that as, as solid information. What we can rely on, on the other hand, are cro close relatives. Hemorrhagic snakes that cause bleedings must be related to each other because they all cause bleeding. So both drops and lactases are very similar, as is Crotalus horridus. They all cause bleeding. Other snakes cause neurological symptoms like Crotalus cascavella, yeah. uh, elapse, etc. They are more the neurological ones. Mm -hmm. that, those are close relatives. Parasitic plants are close relatives because they behave in the same way. Minerals in the in, in a column are related to each other because they sit in the same <laughs> column or they are on the same row. That makes sense to me. One mold is similar to another mold in the fungal kingdom because they are similar in their behavior, similar in their effects, similar in their in their chemicals that they produce. So it is meant 
as a differential diagnosis on a sensible, rational basis of external information outside of the Medicare Medica. That's why it's called close. It, it almost sounds like you're offering the homeopath the chance to do their work properly. And what, what I mean by it is not to sit on the surface of something and just hurry up, you know, and give a remedy, but to really think of, you know, the depths of what that homeopathy is doing to really think, okay, what I am giving, does it make sense? What is it related to? And that relation, is it connected with what I'm trying to do for my patient? Absolutely, because for me, this helps to expand the material medical once more. So you see, uh, you, by repertory, you will always find the one with most symptoms. Uh, simple as that. That uh, goes. But uh, it, it's one-sided. It's um, statistically incorrect. It shouldn't be like that. But when you know what is closely related to legacies, and you look at Botox and Crotalus hoides, you have other possibilities to prescribe on, and not necessarily on the basis of uh, symptoms only, because you could extend it to other members of the Crotalis genus, which are out there in the pharmaceutical companies, have those, sure. but you, you never see them in the material medical because they have no symptoms, because they are related to nothing. If you can relate it to something you know, you have the chance to expand your knowledge. That's the idea of it. it it's, I, I feel almost like uh, you are giving the homeopath a chance to actually think, to actually analyze. You know, and I, I mean, I, I, I don't mean, uh, you, you know, to be uh, unrespectful towards any homeopath, but I think we all share a reality these days, and that's the speed of life. Everything is becoming yeah. faster, everything is becoming, yeah. you know, stressful, but homeopathy cannot just be minimized to, let's just have a quick look at a remedy and, you know, give, 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 you know, just give something that, that is that simple and that shallow. Um, and something like source and substance, I feel can really give the opportunity to a homeopath who wants to learn, know more, become knowledgeable, uh, to really do that. And ultimately, I think you're 100% right in this. Time is of the essence in two ways. We need to use time, as I said before, perhaps an hour a day, just study material medical, just look at what we have, just go through it for a while. And if Source and substance, hopeful, is inspiring reading. It's sometimes it's funny, sometimes interesting. It links to the external world. It links to things that exist outside of the material medica, and the world opens. Yeah. It's really interesting to learn, for instance, how orchids live. It's very interesting what snakes do in their spare time, so to speak, and so <laughs> on. And so. They certainly don't drink tea, I don't think, anyway. <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah. yes, I do believe that it helps to deepen homeopathy to yeah. make it more serious. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's one of my problems with homeopathy. It, it, for, for an outsider, it seems so shallow, as you would say. Yeah. And if we just would be able and willing to connect to serious natural sciences which are out there, like ecology, like anatomy, like uh, uh, zoology, like um... well, I mean, if, if you, I mean, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but for, you know, Hahnemann himself, you know, he was a naturopath in many ways. He was someone who was, in, you know, looking at everything and thinking to himself, okay, how do I get to it? He was a scientist. He was a researcher, and that's what I think makes homeopathy. You need to look at the broad, uh, you know, at the broad side of everything. And you need to be excited about researching, excited about finding out more. If you're not, then it's almost like you're not fulfilling the entirety of the concept of homeopathy in itself. I always had an introduction to his remedies where, where he wrote what was known about it. Our um, advantage of the Hanuman, we know much more. And there is much more information to us available through the internet and libraries that Hahnemann couldn't access. But Hahnemann, in a sense, was a researcher. He looked for things. He was studying things before he undertook it as a proving. Why otherwise would he take one? It was not just what he found uh, outside of his house in his garden growing as a weed. He said, oh, let me do a proving with that one. 
Now, it came from somewhere. He had a basis, he had a foundation for uh, including what he included. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. So, um, 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 there, there was just an, another question that I, that I was thinking of. Obviously, I am aware, um, as our listeners may be, of your other books, of, you know, Metro Medicas like, you know, Monera, Fungi, uh, you know, Prisma, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, for someone who already owns some of your books, should this make a difference? You, you know, would, would it be an addition to what they have? How, how should they feel about source and substance? Well, let, let's take, uh, if we exclude all the, the overlaps in my book, I would say it's about 3,000 book pages. Wow. That's what. Second, if we would count all the remedies together that in these books are discussed, maybe we cut to 1,500, maybe 2,000. That's about it. This is double the amount of remedies that you can find in no book. And it is double or more of the amount of space of book pages that you can find in it's no immense. book. As said, no one is going to publish 8,000 book pages. It's simply not going to happen. So why would you write a Materia Medica about a, 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 a remedy or a substance that has no symptom? Why would you do that? No one is going to buy that. But digitally, in source and substance, I've done just that. There's a lot of uh, information out there that's outside of the Materia Medica, and that's why they have no symptoms. Definitely. Because no one has no one has taken a proofing or something. It doesn't mean that it is value, value, uh, has no value for that reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. And obviously having a digitalized in Red Rupus means that you can search fast. So, you know, it, it's not like you have to sit there and read the full 8,000 pages in a day, but, you know, through the search, you can just, uh, I guess, enlarge your knowledge, you know. As well, a offers you the possibility, for instance, you want to know how many sponges are there in homeopathy, how many molds are there in homeopathy, you just type in the name, you get them all. Yeah. Isn't it? Because it's a word search, and I, I put the name in the category, so right away you can find all that. Exactly. That helps you differentiate by, by you, you type in a, family, a plant family name, and hope you get all the species connected there, yeah. and then... Inside that grouping, you can subdivide if you want. Yeah, yeah, makes perfect sense. Uh, take that as a starting point instead of words uh, or a symptom search and symptom hunt. I think it would be a very, very good alternative to do it that way. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, absolutely, makes really, really does make sense. So, um, I mean, that's really uh, the kind of things that. Um, I had noticed in the information that, that I, you know, had from Source and Substance, which we are really excited about um, having. Uh, are, are there any uh, other additional features that, you know, the listeners, the home of us should be aware of, as, aside from what we've uh, spoken about? In my uh, search for the, the, the origins of 4,275 remedies, I uh, used the internet a lot. I've used certain internet libraries, so to speak. There is one in Boston, there is one in LA, and that's all available. So I've been reading old journals, and I've been reading old allopathic journals from the 19th century, looking for things that are not included in the Materia Medica, or um, only partly included. Those I have all added. I have proofings that no one has found yet or are um, underrepresented. I have poisoning, very interesting poisonings, because in the old days they described the poisoning from the beginning to the end. Nowadays they just say it affects the, the head or the nervous system and, and that's about it and the person died or he didn't die. That those descriptions in these days are very precise and nowadays they call that anecdotal. So they don't pay much attention to it. But in the old days, I collected all that and I've added about 250, 240 of those things to the Materia Medica to source and substance. Stunning, stunning. Okay, so uh, I think that you know leads me to one final question, if I may, Franz. Um, we know that there's a large audience, certainly for Radio Ropus users, that is really di divided between students uh, young homeopaths who are just accessing, you know, their practice and obviously extremely experienced homeopaths. So if I imagine that both, both, you know, all three types of homeopaths and students may be listening to us, 
Would you say source and substance may be okay to use for all three of them? I would say yes. For students, it's another way into the Materia Medica instead of maybe what they learn about Materia Medica at school or the university where they go, where they have thought that it is a symptom. That would be an interesting entry for them. For the experienced ones, they will have additional information that's nowhere else, and it also will um, sort out certain errors. There are identity errors in the Materia Medica sneak in out of the old days, misinformation, uh, misidentification, etc., which I have corrected. Excellent. So for them, that might be useful to learn that, and I think for the experienced ones, the, the, the main advantage of having source and substance will be the, the possibility of the close relatives. Indeed, indeed, because yeah, because that, that will just open up their minds as to different ways to look at what they're right. searching. Yeah, right. fantastic. Okay, Franz, I mean, we're extremely excited, you know, uh, we're very much look, looking forward to this launch. Thank you very much for your time and we look forward to speaking to you again very, very soon. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.